So what I want to talk about today is starting another business. And you know, previously I've given a talk that some of you may have heard about mistakes I made last time I started and ran a business. I think there were some useful uh, lessons learned and some useful content in that talk, but this talk's a little bit more constructive in terms of talking about some of the things that I'm actually going to do in the process of starting a new business. So essentially we'll talk about um, you know, the who of creating a business, what it will be, why you might want to start a business, and most importantly, how. So a little, little bit about me. I, you may think of me as the person who originally created Spring, but in fact I'm a musicologist originally. So I did a um, thesis on piano music in Paris under the July monarchy from 1830 to 1848. So the photograph is there to indicate the fact that I, I think I can say I probably almost certainly know more about Chopin than anyone in the audience. I discovered that at university, really, I had two loves. I loved music and I loved programming. And the order kind of changed from time to time. But I rapidly realized that the ordering of doing music as a career, or particularly academic musicology as a career, and computer programming as a hobby was probably not the right ordering. So I decided that I would reorder. And then, of course, what happened was that I literally didn't touch the piano for 12 years. So the reordering became very, very extreme. But so I gradually got into being a developer and architect in C, C++, and then Java, actually, from a fairly early stage, that gave me the, you know, the con I came to the conclusion that Java, at least for that time, was a pretty great language, but that Java EE, or J2EE as it was at that point, was really pretty foul and vile and suboptimal. So that was the genesis of Spring, trying to deal with that complexity. That, of course, led to Interface 21, which became Spring Source, which became part of VMware, which became part of Pivotal. Um, so, you know, that really led to me being on a business track. By the way, I've, because I know a lot of people associate Spring with XML and Beans, I've just put that there to mess with you, because in case you haven't checked lately, Spring really hasn't required any XML for about five years, really, beyond the stuff that, you know, comes from things like WebXML. So what do I do now? Well, after VMware bought SpringSource, I was an executive at VMware. I was a senior vice president for about two years. I have to say, although there were some great people at that company and they have some amazing technology, it was not a tremendously positive experience because you know, I discovered that I really am an entrepreneur rather than someone who can be happy at an, as an executive at a large company. So with that realization in mind, since I left VMware, I've been involved in startups through a number of boards and also various other investments. So I'm a board member and chair at Neo4j, the graph database company. I'm a board member and the first uh, outside investor in Elastic, which of course is the company behind Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. I'm also a board member at Typesafe, uh, Meteor, and Hazelcast. This has been very interesting in terms of getting a different perspective on you know, the challenges, triumphs, and dangers of the startup world. I think I've learned more about open source business, about financing rounds, um, and actually I've got financing twice there, haven't I? No, financing is actually quite important in, in the startup, startup world. So that's who I am. The question of like, what my new company will do well, I've read the code of conduct and I'm not quite sure what I can say here. Because frankly, I, my first, the first thing that came into my mind is if I tell you, I'd need to kill you. But I'm not sure that the code of conduct is entirely consistent with threatening to kill the audience. So I thought I'd get out of that by building on the James Bond theme. 
And so, you know, this, this currently is a secret mission. So I'm not going to be talking at all about what my new company will do, and I'm certainly not going to be trying to plug anything that it will eventually do. What I'm going to talk about is how I'm going about it with the lessons that I've learned, and how hopefully that can be beneficial to anyone who's interested in startups. Before we get into the how, there is the question of why. Now, I would love to find the person who authored the version of this I saw on Twitter, and I spent about half an hour today scouring the internet to try to find that original so I could give that person credit. I didn't find it. What I discovered is I guess it's become a meme. It's kind of spread across the internet, and several people have copied it without attribution. So this was an entrepreneur whom I saw a tweet about his emotional cycle as an entrepreneur. And I think this does convey the fact that this is a very intense life experience. It can be a lot of fun. It can be very, very bad. Over time, you probably get better at managing the inherent bipolarity of this experience. But it's, you know, it is going to have a big imprint on your life. It's going to have a big footprint on your time. So for anyone who's you know, thinking of starting a business, or alternatively, who is thinking of joining an early stage startup, you really want to think about, you know, do you really want this? It will have an impact on your family, your friends. They may no longer be your friends. On your hobbies, which you will have kind of forgotten as I almost did with the piano. And also, there is, there is a pretty high likelihood it will fail. So the reason that I include a slide like this is I do sometimes think there's a little bit too much glorification of you know, entrepreneurship as something that's inherently more worthy than other things, or something that everyone should do. It really bugs me that there's this kind of implicit glorification that it's more worthy. Because, for example, if you look at academic research, you look at these whole, you know, this whole edifice on which entrepreneurs build, it's kind of a little annoying when you know, entrepreneurs often get a lot more credit than potentially they deserve. And secondly, you know, there's a lot about it that's absolutely wonderful, but there is a lot about it that's quite tough. So having known all that, why do I want to do this, this thing again? I think it comes down to a few things. The biggest is that I want to build something great. And having had that experience at a huge corporation with VMware, you know, the company when I was there had somewhere between you know, 1.5 billion and 3 billion in cash. It was still very difficult to do something great. To do something great required dealing with internal politics. It do required dealing with a degree of bureaucracy. It also required looking across the product portfolio and thinking, does this compete with something that we have in our portfolio? There's a whole lot of drags on the ability of large companies to execute. So you know, if I think about wanting to do something great, there are really two places I could think of doing that. One would be an open source, and one would be a startup. And in fact, of course, in a startup, generally these days, you're going to play a big role in open source. You're going to contribute to open source. So that's not mutually exclusive. Secondly, and this is a very powerful personal motivation to me, I just love working with great people. And I love working with them every day. So it's not just a relationship where we have a weekly call or go to a board meeting. It's a relationship you know, where everyone is part of the same team. Everyone wants to fight the same battle. Everyone wants to win in creating this something great and finding people who will use and buy it. I've also observed that I appear to be happier when I work hard. Uh, I, obviously, I wouldn't need to be in a startup to do that. But the points in my life where I think I've been happiest has been when I'm working hard. And I've realized that I haven't been working hard enough lately. So essentially, I miss playing the game rather than coaching. Interestingly, you will note that money wasn't at the top of the list. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to say that it's not a motivation. But it's nowhere near uh, my primary motivation. And I think, frankly, that's true of the repeat entrepreneurs that 
I've encountered. So now, the bulk of the talk will be about how. So I do assume that you have some interest in creating a startup, but even if you know that this is something you are never personally going to want to do, I would hope that there are some of the things that I'm going to talk about that have value. For example, if you are a technical person and you get a job offer from a small company, that could be by far the best thing that's ever happened in your professional career, or it could be a really depressing way to waste six months, 12 months, 18 months, um, and go backwards financially. So, you know, thinking about some of these things and being aware of them, I think really can be quite valuable, even if you're not that interested in the business side for its own sake. You also may think that some of the advice is a bit obvious, to which I would have to say that I find that a lot of people maybe haven't heard these kind of things enough because a lot of people um, get some of the very basic things wrong. And I think it's kind of important that we keep talking about them until people more consistently avoid those mistakes. So a big part of the presentation is going to um, share what I'm going to do myself in the context of setting up a new company. So every time you see this cheesy little graphic, this kind of means entrepreneur's diary. It means this is something that I'm actually doing in the process of the new business. So firstly, when you set out, you really should, you really should think you're going to be successful, right? You should know something that hopefully the rest of the world doesn't know. Because if you don't have something special in terms of your vision, everybody will do it. Well, this man on the right here is Paul Moritz. Paul Moritz was um, the number three executive at Microsoft until 2000. He was later CEO of uh, VMware. He was responsible for VMware's acquisition of SpringSource. Paul really was um, one of the, if not the greatest technology visionary I've ever had the privilege to work with. Um, and one of the key things I learned from Paul is the idea of being very explicit about having a thesis. So if you're going to build something, you don't want to build necessarily to solve the problems that everyone recognizes right now. You want to look at problems that are emerging and you want to be ready for when the next thing happens and have a solution ahead of time. There's other ways, obviously, of um, expressing this. One other way of thinking about this is the way I think most VCs think. VCs really look for genuine problems. Like, if you go and pitch to a VC, one of the things that's really important is, are you solving a real problem? Let's suppose you have a great product but it does something that doesn't actually solve a real problem, that's a big problem. Let's suppose you've identified a big, fat, hairy problem, and your product isn't quite right. If you've got a good team, you can iterate. The same way that you can iterate with code to make your tests pass or to um, fix other kinds of bugs, you can iterate with product to um, solve that problem. But you are in a lot of trouble if you latched onto something that turns out not to be a real problem. Talking about iteration and how we you know, have the basis to iterate for success in business, the fundamental foundation is a good team. How many people use Slack? Slack's pretty great, isn't it? How many people knew that Slack started off as a game company? So Slack. Um, it was one of the fastest um, companies ever to a $1 billion valuation, and to use the lingo, it pivoted. It started in something completely different and pivoted to something which the world loves. So why was it able to do that? Well, obviously, there are some pretty great people um, at Slack, and they were able to look at the fact that their previous product wasn't working. They were able to look at the assets that their company had, and they were able to pivot to something that has been immensely successful. This actually brings in um, one of my favorite quotes from Peter Drucker, um, the management theorist, which is, execution eats strategy for breakfast. So when you think about team, or when an investor thinks about team, 
they're really thinking, can this team execute? Because you can have brilliant ideas and not actually be that great um, at execution. By the way, in case anybody thinks, oh God, this is MBA drivel, I would encourage you to remember that although technology has changed a whole lot, people haven't. And a lot of you know, what you might dismiss as MBA drivel, drivel is based on you know, real experience of people over many years. And people haven't just changed because we've got a lot of cool um, technological possibilities. So talking about team, probably the first thing that you're going to want to do is assemble a team of founders. The first thing, if you're going to do anything of any scale, complexity and ambition, the first thing you should do is have more than one founder. Why? Because amongst other things, even the most brilliant person is going to be wrong quite a bit of the time. And if they don't have anyone within the company who can tell them when they're wrong, that isn't going to go very well. Secondly, nobody is uniformly strong. So for example, take Paul Moretz. I mean, he is possibly the brightest person I know, amazing visionary. He is not as strong on the execution side. I mean, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. So the only way to solve that is either find the you know, one perfect human being who has ever existed, or more likely, go out and find a bunch of people, a small bunch of people, but who together are pretty balanced and don't all think the same way. When you've done that, you should, while you're doing that, you should also make sure that you understand what everyone's values and goals are. So let's suppose you have a group of um, co-founders and say two of them are intent on working as hard as it possibly uh, they can possibly work to make this thing successful. And a third is really interested in working nine to five and taking out a big salary. That really isn't going to work. The only way that potentially might work is if they have a completely open conversation and that person, for example, owns less equity, gets the salary they want, but you know, it's a different kind of role. So you know, it's very important to be utterly transparent about these kind of things and make sure everybody's goals are aligned. So what are we actually doing in the new company that I'm setting up, which does something that is very secret? So we've got currently five people on board at this point. We've got myself. We've got three strong technologists. I mean, at this point in time, I'm kind of almost a fake technologist. But you know, these three people are actually still real technologists. But they're not all the same. They're all, I would say, technically brilliant. But they have specialized in different things, either you know, towards the vision, scientific end of the spectrum, or towards the management end of the spectrum. So you know, that is, again, trying to build a group of people that are mixed and have different strengths and weaknesses. And I've also added an experienced executive who's been at a, a number of startups, a big company, um, and has been involved in both corporate development and business, uh, business development roles. When you're assembling a team, one of the things that you really should do sooner rather than later is allocate equity among founders. You could choose to do this quite early, or you could choose to delay it. This is a very difficult conversation, right? It's not a conversation that you want to have with people who might be your friends or people that you hope would be your friends. It's, you know, I mean, this is the one point in building a startup where your idea, your um, interests are not quite the same. They're certainly not utterly opposed, but there is going to be a tension. So it's really difficult. So what should you do? Well, if you delay talking about it, it will be like, let's suppose that conversation that you really want to have with your neighbor about the dog that your neighbor has that barks and keeps you awake. Is it easier to have that conversation now or when you've lost three months of sleep and are very, very, very angry? Generally, if you have a difficult conversation, I think, in virtually any field, it's only going to get more difficult. So, you know, just embrace the pain up front and try to do it in a way that is fair. 
You know, avoid people getting upset with each other. How will you do that? Firstly, you should learn about it. There are some fantastic resources out there. So if you just Google allocating equity among founders, you'll find some great articles. There's even a couple of calculators like the founders.com startup equity calculator. It's not a perfect tool by any means. But you know, if you look at these things, these resources that are available to you, you will actually have a basis for having a conversation which is based on facts and you know, which can really smooth these difficulties. I mean, one of my lessons that I've learned from management is that things that are inherently sensitive are much easier if you actually bring data in. Like, de-emotionalize it, make sure that you're bringing in data points um, to ensure that you can be fair. So what have we done? We've been absolutely transparent in this process. So I think fundamentally anyone who's in the CEO role needs to actually come up with a recommendation. But what do you base it on? We've based it on no a number of data points. Uh, and then we've had a completely open discussion about it. So no back channels, no opportunity for you know, any people to get together behind other people's backs. And the result is it's been extremely smooth and has avoided what could have been um, a source of tension. I talked about startup resources. In that particular area, there are quite a few. But if you look now, it is a sea change in the last 10 years. When we set out and founded Interface 21, I knew virtually nothing about uh, creating and running a software startup. And I learned, at least in the early years, through making mistakes, doing some things that appeared to work, and also through mentors, basically. These days, certainly, you should still learn by experience, and you should still try to find mentors. But the web is your friend. Google is your friend. It is amazing how much is out there. So for example, 10 years ago, VC funding was kind of, at least from an entrepreneur's perspective, was a bit of a dark mystery. Like, exactly what do these people want? How does it work? What are good terms? What are bad terms? Just go Google it. And like any term that you um, will see on a term sheet will be discussed quite extensively online. One of the things that you need to do if you have an idea about which you're excited is you should think about what kind of opportunity this is. Um, this is. Amongst other things, you should think about market sizing. You know, could this be, if you were really successful, is this company worth a billion dollars? Is it worth more? Is it worth $20 million? That is pretty fundamentally important to be very clear about that. Because you may well make a lot of money by, you know, really nailing that $20 million market. But clearly, that's not something that you would want to raise external capital for. You would pursue that business in a different way. You also need to consider how fast should you run. Businesses often need either time or money. They need, well, usually they need both, but often it's clear which one they need more. So for example, when we looked at Interface 21, we really needed time more than money. Early on, we needed to you know, see if this kind of wave of spring adoption was going to continue to build. And if we just tried to add money, we would have looked fake. In the developer community, you know, I mean, not only can you not magic up more developer adoption, you can't just magic up more open source community, but you also run the risk of kind of almost perverting something that um, was developing. For my new company, I believe we actually need to take more money up front because I think we need to execute fast in a noisy, competitive environment. Another thing that is important to think about is the impact of your business model. You can have um, a SaaS business that, for example, grows without needing that much outside funding. Take GitHub. GitHub has actually taken a lot of capital, but they got a surprisingly long way without external financing. And they did that because 
their business where you know people put in their credit card number and you and I pay up seven bucks a month or whatever it is, um, that enabled them to get cash flow very soon. Let's suppose your business model is reliant on selling to all the banks that are around the city. That means you're going to have a long sales cycle. So you, know, you probably are going to have a sales cycle of anywhere between six or 12 months or even longer. It also means that they're going to take a long time to pay you. So for example, when GitHub bills us, they presumably get the money fairly quickly. Whereas if we bill any of these banks, the soonest we're going to see that money is 90 days, and that's if we have a collections person who chases it up. Um, if you are young and naive as an entrepreneur, you don't actually think about that, and you find that they basically don't highly prioritize paying you to the point where you can actually potentially get bad debts. So you've got to think that if that is the nature of your business, you know, the um, actual um, cash flow circumstance will really affect the nature of your business. You could have a good business, but it could take you too long to get your money, and that, that could be the difference between success and failure. So how do you decide whether you want outside money? You need to really reflect on what you want to do. If your opportunity is a relatively small market, you may well build a good business, but you're not going to be that attractive to venture investors. The way venture investors work is essentially, at some level, they buy lottery tickets, right? If your lottery ticket is for a lot, if there's a, imagine you've got a similar number of tickets, and some of them might return 100,000 pounds, and some of them might return 50 million pounds. Well, you're probably going to buy the tickets that have the higher return, other things being equal. So, you know, investors know that um, many, if not most, of their investments will be failures, and therefore it, they need um, to ensure that the successes they have are so big that they far more than make up for the failures. It depends on what you want to do. So, for example, if you're building a product rather than, um, say, building a services company, it is pretty unusual to be successful without taking some external money. If you're creating a consultancy style business, don't take external money, um, partly because investors don't like that kind of business, but also because they're more cash efficient businesses. You can actually get a long way um, without needing external money. Broadly speaking, it will cost less than it used to, um, because of things like the cloud and SAT, the availability of SaaS uh, platforms you can use, but it will cost more than you think. When you look at choice of sources of investment, you've got many types of investors. So you've got angels, you've got VCs. Um, a couple of things I would say is be careful with angels because very often you'll find they don't engage in the business and they can actually you know, complicate your cap table um, without any real benefit. And secondly, remember that VCs are not created equal. So consider the location, whether that's you know, where you want to have your company headquarters, for example, um, brand and reputation of both the firm and the partner, um, and rapport. Like You should feel really comfortable with the partner with whom you're doing the deal. If you, you know, find that an uncomfortable process working with that partner to um, deal with getting through um, to the financing round, it isn't going to get better. In fact, if anything goes wrong in your company, that relationship will probably get a whole lot worse. And remember that valuation is a, an important metric, but it's also a bit of a vanity metric. So it's you know, the one thing that a lot of entrepreneurs will fixate on. And there are plenty of other terms in um, term sheets that actually can be really, really important. So don't just uh, fixate on valuation. Two personal observations I've made are that those who most hate VCs most need what good VCs have to offer. And secondly, virtually all the successful entrepreneurs I know who could self-finance to self-fund a new venture don't do that. 
they typically go to their favorite VCs and establish that relationship from the beginning. Why would they do that? I think the biggest reason is desire to have the network as well as the money and also desire to have a partner. Because typically if you know, somebody has been successful, they're going to be pretty self-confident. And it's actually very healthy to you know, establish a partnership where somebody even outside the company has the ability to say, well, you know, this thing here isn't really working, is it? So, you know, having that ability to have a really honest relationship with someone who potentially is very experienced, has seen this movie many times before, that is a really valuable thing. It's not just about the money. If you do want to get outside investors, how would you go about it? So if you're thinking about a pitch, there's really three things that are important. The first, I would say, is the problem and the market opportunity. Is it a real problem that you solve? And is it worth solving that problem? I mean, is this something that a lot of people are going to pay you a lot of money for? Then there's the team that will go about solving that problem and selling the solution. Are they credible? Notice I've got product in brackets. Product is obviously incredibly important in the end, but product is one of those things that you can iterate on much more easily than you can iterate on product. So if you think about these four things here, market opportunity, can you iterate on that? No, you cannot. It is fixed. So there's either a real market there or there's not. Problem, can you iterate on that? Not easily. You would probably need to do a pivot. Team, prefer not to iterate on that. It is, it is possible, but you know, it's clearly not plan A. Whereas product, you've got more chance of iterating there. What I would strongly recommend is anything at all that you want to do, even if you don't want money, if you're not trying to raise money, create a pitch deck. Pretend that you're trying to persuade someone why your company is the most exciting thing ever. It's really good as a sanity check. It gives you a discipline. And also, it's remarkable how when you try to distill something down, you sometimes discover that it's fighting you, right? You're trying to create this 10 or 15 um, slide deck explaining it. And it's kind of the narrative isn't gelling. It's not a clear story. That's actually telling you something really, really important. If you can't distill it down, if you can't, for example, come up with an elevator pitch or a mission statement, that's actually a really telling sign you need to think about why that is so and see how you can change it. You also need, when you're pitching for investment, to think about what you do with this. You're not going to, it's most unlikely that you'll take one run, round of financing and never need money ever again. So what does it do? Does it get you to series B? Does it get you to series A if it's a seed? Does it get you to IPO? You know, there has to be, and why will your next financing round be better? What will you have achieved? Will you have gained users? Will you have proved that your product works? Will you have gotten to the point where you just need to pay money, spend money to build out the um, sales and marketing machine? So think about what you're going to achieve. Of course, when you raise money, you take dilution. So people give you money, they come and they take a share in your company. I think things are getting better in this respect in that people have a much better understanding now of how this works. But I do think that a lot of entrepreneurs are still unduly concerned about dilution. And this manifests itself in two ways. One is that they try to raise too little money or alternatively they don't raise money when they should have. So they own all or more of the company and then the company you know, potentially can get into trouble. It can have, to use the lingo, too short a runway. So it's kind of good to take off before you hit the end of the runway. Secondly, another way in which hatred of di or fear of dilution manifests itself is in terms of the option pearl. So it's a good practice in just about any company to have a pretty large option pearl. That enables you to bring on really good people and make sure they're strongly incented to come and work for you and that they, you know, they feel they've got real skin in the game. 
If you have too small an option pool, you can't do that. So the founders don't get diluted, but the value of the company is greatly re reduced because you can't get the right talent. I have often seen the situation where inexperienced entrepreneurs will kind of fight with VCs about this. Look, sure, there are games that VCs sometimes play in terms of where the option, at what point the option pool goes in. There's, there are a few ga games that you know, both entrepreneurs and investors can play, but fundamentally the option pool should be large, and it's a good thing. It's not a win to beat investors down and have a small option pool, because trust me, you're going to have to put in a big one, bigger one later. So dilution is not the enemy. The enemy is failure. So, you know, just remember that anything where you materially increase risk in your business by um, avoiding dilution, it's probably not that smart. Corporate setup. Remember I said that you need to allocate equity amongst founders as soon as possible? You also need to set up a company as soon as possible. It seems like very obvious advice, but for example, I didn't follow that advice when I set up Interface 21, and we, we had some problems because of that. Our corporate structure was kind of messed up. We really didn't kind of bite the bullet, do it properly at the beginning. When you set up your corporate structure, you really should keep it boring. No, your company is not different. There are a whole bunch of things that are typically used, um, such as you know, the standard option pool, a whole bunch of standard or near standard agreements. Do what people do. Do not try to be inventive. One of the best pieces of advice that I got fairly early in my startup career was innovate in your technology. Don't innovate you know, corporate structure, legals, anything like that. Just adds friction. Similarly, don't, you know, sometimes people try to set things up that give a lower corporate tax rate. You know what? Most startups are going to make a loss for years anyway, so that's not the most immediate problem. And secondly, it's not going to, you know, enhance your possibility of a trade sale or IPO. So, you know, it's probably a non-goal. So what have we done with this respect? Well, firstly, we just thought about the opportunity and we think we need to run fast. So we're going to do a friends and family seed round in a quick series A. We are going to practice what I preach. And I and my co-founders are personally diluting more than is usual to put in a large option pool to help attract great talent. We've decided we're going to have the headquarters in San Francisco and raise from Bay Area investors. However, I would note that if I lived in London today, I would raise in London. So when I founded Interface 21, I lived in London. We ultimately raised money in Palo Alto, California. At that time, I think the London ecosystem wasn't what it is now. London is now a pretty great place um, to raise money and to um, run a startup. So you know, I think if I lived here, I think I'd actually probably try to build um, the headquarters here. We have also decided to have a distributed engineering team from the outset. Uh, I think, to me, that is a no-brainer because you want to be able to find great talent wherever it is. And also, we've learned through you know, the various process improvements in software over the last few years, through open source and other collaboration, we've learned how to work together as distributed teams. You know, let's let's um, embrace that up front and be able to bring on great people wherever they're found. What did we do with corporate setup? We found the most boring possible corporate um, setup approach. This, by the way, is a sign in Boring, Oregon. It's actually a real town, and it's paired with Dull, <laughs> Scotland. I believe that Oregon actually has um, a... Um, statewide boring and dull day to one of those two towns. So what is the most boring thing you can possibly do? Well, it turns out it's a Delaware top coat. So if you're setting something up in the US, it's just like, imagine lawyers are coming along and doing due diligence, for example, for an investment round on your company. And they start looking at stuff. They see Delaware top coat, yep, that's fine. Let's suppose they see that your company's in Florida 
or even California or New York. It just potentially adds somewhere between a tiny little bit and a lot more attention. So, for example, it may well be that your acquirer or investor's law firm sees an opportunity here to spin up some billings around exploring this. You just don't want that. Keep it simple. So everything that we're doing is based around being simple and conventional to reduce friction um, at all points in the future. And sure, there are some things that we would have kind of liked to do, some more special things. And for the most part, we've thought, you know what? It's not worth it. Let's, let's keep it simple. People. Guess what? People are important. One of the things you should consider in your company is you're going to need good managers. The second thing is that you should model the behavior you want to see. I've seen a lot of startups obsess around culture and they explicitly discuss culture and they have policy guidelines. Sure, that stuff is important to a point, but there is one thing that is more powerful and that thing is how the founders conduct themselves. So for example, obviously you will have a culture that's you know, respectful of diversity, that absolutely rules out sexual harassment, etc. And that will be in your policies, and it should be clear. But even more powerful than that is the founders behaving in such a way that everybody realizes that this is just not on, that this company is a respectful um, company and it values everybody. So a good example of this is Oracle. Oracle is a particularly large company. Oracle is also a very successful company, and some of its products are very good. Um, so you know, I wouldn't be wholly negative about Oracle. How many people here think Oracle is a nice company? I, I would expect people. <laughs> So, you know, Oracle is clearly a company that's worthy of respect and it's a great company. But it has a very particular way of operating, which to some degree reflects the personality of Larry Ellison. Um, and, you know, I mean, the guy is a successful guy. Um, but my point is that how the founders behave scales up to an astonishing degree inside companies. So, you know, think about that. When you because it also touches on that point of how do you build that founding team. So again, if everybody is very, very similar, that isn't going to be very good either, right? Because you'll, as the company is built out, it'll feel unwelcoming to people who are different from that um, founder profile. People. Another part of people is networking. So whenever you're thinking of um, starting a business or pursuing a business, you should talk to people a very large proportion of, my time, of your time. So for example, when I started with Interface 21, probably the first two years, I would frequently get to the end of a day and think, I accomplished nothing today. This is so frustrating. Because I was still you know, thinking of, in terms of my productivity by how much code I'd written or how many problems, technical problems I'd solved. And gradually that kind of declined to the point where I really couldn't write much code at all. And over time, I realized that I actually was achieving something. It was just something very, very different. And all that talking to people actually was kind of important. So some specific things you might want to do around networking are, you know, talk to everybody you know who may have a useful perspective. Interview potential customers to validate your ideas, and also hiring. So, I mean, one thing I've found, particularly with engineering hiring, is technical recruiters have not been useful to my portfolio companies, whereas getting engineers who are already at those companies, getting founders out, talking to people, that's much more effective. And you also should maintain and build a network of potential advisors and investors. There's a saying in the Valley, this is, I think, so old that I've no idea who first said it. If you want money, Ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. But you know, the asking bit is really important. You should talk to people constantly, regardless of whether you want anything from them. That's actually something that is pretty great about the Silicon Valley culture. 
that very often in other cultures, if you ask somebody something, for example, like an introduction, it's viewed as you know, calling in a favor. Whereas I think Silicon Valley people tend to take a longer view, where they're very happy to you know, help put people together. And there's no expectation of immediate payback. So you know, another side of this is that if you can help anybody else, if they ask you anything, you know, it, it's really important to be um, as helpful as you can and willing um, to help other people as well. I mentioned the change in my role at Interface 21. As you build a company, typically you'll find at least one founder will change role, from a primarily technical role to a primarily business role. And you really do have to recruit or grow business people. I do believe a lot of technical people tend to be a bit arrogant in this respect. They believe that because, you know, for example, when they meet sales or marketing people, they think they're smarter than those people are on average. They don't need domain expertise. You know, the fact is that even if that belief is true, IQ isn't actually the high order bit. And it is a different skill set. And I do think that a lot of technical people think you can just kind of learn about this stuff from first principles, and then obviously you'll be better than the best marketer or best salesperson out there. It's not quite as simple as that. Also, you really need to think not only about what your market opportunity is and what you're going to build, but how you'll sell it. Like, will you sell like Atlassian or like Oracle, for example? You know, very, very different. One is very low touch sales motion, whereas the other uses a traditional enterprise sales motion. I think the world is moving, broadly speaking, to lower touch sales motions. But nevertheless, the same approach is not correct for every business. And finally, as with respect to law firms and the like, pay for good advice, um, or at least pay for the best advice you can afford at any point in time, um, because it really can save you problems down the track. So I hope this has been useful um, to you. I would leave you with one final thought, which is it's about people, not software, but then on the other hand, when you think about it, software is about people as well. There really is nothing in the technical domain that when you try to scale it out, build a team, you know, execute anything complex, it always comes down to people rather than technology in the end. Thanks.